Now, one issue that, of course, arose in the immediate aftermath of Lincoln's election is why not wait for, in the South, a quote-unquote overt act? In other words, Lincoln's not even in office yet, and what can he do anyway? Why, rely, why not rely on the Democratic majority in Congress, on Republican declarations that they intended no attack on slavery where it existed? Um, many Southerners said this. Alexander Stevens of Georgia, who becomes the, Confe the Confederate vice president, is strongly opposed to secession. He says it's foolhardy. There's no reason to do it at this point. Yes, if Lincoln starts attacking slavery, that's fine. But at this point, it, it's actually a dangerous step and with consequences no one can foresee. On the other hand, and here's where the Sinop book comes in, we have to recognize that certainly in the 1850s, a small group but growing of Southern radicals had propagandized enormously the idea of an independent Southern nation and its glorious future. Southern culture and society were superior to those of the North. Slave labor was superior to free labor. The Southern destiny was of a great empire, a slave empire, the Caribbean, Cuba, we've talked about that, Central America. That could only be attained through, in, through independence. It seemed by the late 1850s that slavery was not going to be expanding into the Western territories very effectively, but it certainly could expand in the Caribbean and Central America, they said. Um, a South freed of Northern influence, freed of Northern economic exploitation, as they would put it, um, and the belief, whether true or not, that slavery needed to expand to survive. Many people, including me, don't believe that's true, but people believed it which, and acted on that, on that belief. In the Union, the prospect of expansion was limited, especially because by 1860, most Southerners saw Douglas Democrats as no different from Republicans. Both had blocked the expansion of slavery into Kansas, and there was little chance it was going to be expanding anywhere else. But outside of the Union, well, this is what one Mississippi newspaper says in 1860. The southern states, once constituted as an independent nation, the acquisition of Mexico, Central America, Cuba, and other West Indian islands would follow as a direct and necessary result. So they're no longer worried about, you know, Nebraska or Utah or New Mexico. They're thinking about other areas, many of which had had slavery, some of which still had, Cuba still is a thriving slave economy at this point, uh, but why not reinstitute slavery in Central America or some of the uh, islands of the Caribbean? Um, and behind this, I believe anyway, was a fear for the future of slavery, fear about the future of slavery in the United States. Not, as some historians argue, because of a uh, uh, some historians have argued, well, the real issue is not slavery per se, but racial control. The fear that if slavery ends, you won't be able to, you won't, the white supremacy will be undermined. That is ridiculous. You didn't need slavery for racial control. The North showed that very well. The North didn't have slavery, but, ra but the blacks were certainly unequal in the North. Freeing the Nowhere in the Western Hemisphere had freed slaves become equal in any significant way to the white population. In the British Isles, power still rested with a small white elite, uh, et cetera. So the notion that you needed slavery to keep white supremacy in existence just is not, it was, was refuted by history. It's slavery as more than that, as, as, a, as a society, as a system, as a way of life. Um, and here I think, to go back to a book not on our list, uh, the, the book by, the old work by Eugene Genovese, the historian, still has merit, even though historians have, as I say, lately rejected his economic analysis of slavery and see it as a much more dynamic, modernized system. But his notion that you're talking here about a society, a, a system, a way of life that is said to be in danger, that is what secession is trying to do, to defend a threatened social order. Um, now, in the secession crisis, many opponents of secession say the, that secession is the worst way to do that, that secession will lead to war and war will destabilize slavery. 
that it's dangerous. Uh, there was no, uh, you know, there was no secret about this. War had destabilized slavery all over the place, including in the United States itself, in the American Revolution. A war fought where slavery exists is going to destabilize the institution of slavery and maybe destroy it. That's what people like Stevens and many others said. They're not any less defenders of slavery, but they say slavery is a lot safer in the Union than through this un, you know, predictable process of, uh, of secession. So then we get to, you know, the, uh, obviously talk about this in the discussion sections. These issues are still on the table today. What is a nation anyway? Who has the right to form a nation and under what circumstances? Here's an article from the Financial Times. Look at the headlines. Scotland can be a model for how to handle separatism. Scotland is voting in the fall, I think, a referendum on whether to secede from Great Britain and designate Scotland as a independent nation. It's not a war, it's, not, it's a referendum. And if the people of Scotland decide they want to form their own nation, I don't think Prime Minister Cameron is going to send troops to invade Scotland? Uh, no, they've, they're having this referendum for that purpose. They had such a referendum in Quebec some years ago. The people of Quebec voted against leaving Canada, but they had that option. On the other hand, as the subheading here says, there are remarkably few examples of nations breaking up in a civilized way. It would be very nice if we could do that, but it doesn't seem to happen all that, all that often. People may remember the Nigerian Civil War of the 1960s and 70s, where the part of Nigeria called Biafra tried to secede and led to a terribly bloody war. Um, today, uh, now, the, read the newspapers, there's thought of Ukraine maybe breaking up. Eastern Ukraine may try to secede from Western Ukraine um, because of the events that have taken place there in the last few days. Um, and what would happen then? I don't know, probably more war. So it's, it's, it's not, and then who is entitled to be a nation and who isn't anyway? Does every people in the world deserve their own national state? There are plenty of peoples who don't. The Basques, for example, in Spain have been kind of demanding a state, but they don't have it. The Kurds, look at the Kurds. There are Kurds in, um, in Iraq, in Syria, in Turkey. Why isn't there a Kurdish nation? There's no reason the Kurds deserve a nation as much as the Czechs or the Slovaks, etc. It's just they don't have the power. Tough luck, Kurds. You know, you're out of luck, Kurds. I'm sorry. They don't have the power to create such a nation. Turkey, Iraq, and Syria have all said, forget it. We're not allowing these Kurds, so that's it. If they are managed to fight and win, then they'll be a nation. But it, the, to my mind, the idea that every people deserves a nation state is the worst, one of the worst ideas ever concocted in human history. It's a 19th century idea given, more, uh, 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 create, uh, given impetus by Woodrow Wilson, who redrew the map of Europe and laid the groundwork for war for another hundred years, um, because it, it assumes that, people, that these areas are homogenous. There are always minorities within each area. I, the people People have flowed around all through, all through history. The notion that there's one people in one physical area is ridiculous. There are majorities, but there are always minorities, and that then becomes a giant source of, of, of fighting and what language you're going to use. You know, the, so the, the, the linking of the state with an ethnic or religious or notion is just a recipe for the oppression of minorities who are not part of of that, if that's the definition of the state. No nation is homogenous, or, nor should it be. It's kind of boring if, it's all, if everyone is the same, I would have to say. But anyway, that's, you know, that's fine. If the Kurds want a nation, maybe they can get one. That's cool. Don't bother me. Um, was the South a nation? Was the South a nation before the Civil War? David Potter, a great Southern historian of the South, wrote a brilliant essay long ago on historians and nationalism. And what he said was, he said, all right, was the South a nation? Well, it didn't actually have many of the characteristics that we associate with nationality. It had spoke the same language as the rest of the country. Religion was pretty much the same as the rest of the country. Ethnic background, 
not really all that different, same political institutions. Um, what Potter said is if you attribute, if the historian attributes nationality to a group, that elevates their claim to statehood. In other words, the historian is going around as a umpire of these battles. Are the Basques a nation? If I say no, well, that means that Spain has no obligation to let the Basques have their own state. On the other hand, I say, yeah, these Basques, they're so different. Well, then that suggests they should have a nation state, at least in the Basques' point of view. But the point is, this is a historical issue. It's not an abstract issue. How nations develop is something that comes out of history, not out of political theory. Um, and um, once a group achieves national independence, it then immediately starts to create a nationalist history, which sees the past as a straight line to the nation state. That's why I quoted this at the very beginning of the term. The historian is the enemy of the nation in the simple fact that we tried to knock down these nationalist mythologies. And uh, it's often, and I'm not just talking about the United States, anywhere. Uh, look at Pakistan. There's a whole, I'm, I'm just picking them out, not because they're worse or better than anyone else, but because I know someone who wrote a book about this. There's a whole invented historiography of Pakistan which shows that from the year 1000 to 1947, history was moving in a straight line toward Pakistani independence. You know, it's ridiculous, but that's, you know, a nation needs a history like that. So in other words, what Pat is saying, if the South had won in the Civil War, then they'd be a nation, and then they'd have a national history, which would be created by historians. But, um, but why then did they secede if they didn't share a lot of these elements of nationality? Potter says what really holds a nation together, what really holds a nation together is none of those other things but community of interest. As law in a heterogeneous society, as long as each group feels that its basic interests are not going to be violated, then it doesn't matter what language they speak and what religion is there and everything. It's community of interest. In the secession crisis, he says, enough Southerners lost the confidence that what they considered their interests were safe within the nation to desire another nation. So that's, you know, I'm not telling you this is the answer. This is a debate, a question which is debated all the time, including right now, and people can figure out their own answers if they want. 